And let's open to John chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. John 10, beginning in verse 9. A couple of things as you're getting settled. The, the junior hires are now welcome to head up to the youth center. Uh, Andrew will meet you there. He's going to uh, bring a message and teaching just for that age group. So if you're in junior high, you're welcome to move up to the fellowship hall if you would like. Also, if you've got your smartphones with you, your iPads, you're welcome to take them out now. Pull down our church app and go to the current teachings, and you can follow along our notes uh, with the church app. Let's pray. The title of our message this morning is Living Life to the Full, Living Life to the Full. Father, we honor you as we come and pray that you would just minister your life to us through your word. We're so thankful that you reveal your heart to us and your desire to bless our lives and to pour out your favor. And Lord, we pray that this morning that you would just move in a powerful way upon us, that you would transform us because we have your heart. So we open our heart right now to receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're picking it right up. In the middle of a conversation, Jesus is speaking to a crowd and, and he's in Jerusalem, but he's also speaking to these Jewish leaders and uh, if you remember in our last couple of conversations, he first called them blind, uh, then he called them deaf, he could not hear, but this week he calls them thieves and robbers, and he explains then that he is the good shepherd, and that the sheep hear his voice, and that was one of the things we were looking at, is that relationship between a shepherd and a sheep. It's a picture for us of that relationship that God has with us through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a powerful picture when you see all the aspects of it. The sheep hear his voice. Um, he calls his sheep by name. He leads them. Uh, he, he goes before them. That's an interesting thing about shepherds is that they go before the sheep and the, the, fee, the sheep just, you know, they all follow behind them because there's a relationship and they hear his voice, they follow him. Very different than cattle. Cattle, you get behind them and you got to drive them. And so uh, it's a beautiful picture for us. He, the sheep follow because they know his voice. But the theme of the verses of the rest of the message is really going to be centered on verse 10, where we're going to study today, where Jesus is explaining that the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he said, I've come that they might have life and have it, here it is, abundantly. Have it to the full. This is a theme of the entire gospel. The, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, he goes on to explain. And that, of course, is a picture for us of the Lord, laying down his life that we might have a eternal life. In fact, jump over, if you would, to verses 26 and 28. You see this picture for us. Notice in verse 26, he said, uh, you don't believe, speaking to the Jewish leaders, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and here it is, they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. I give eternal life to them. This is the picture that we have. From John 10, we know that God's heart is not only to give us eternal life, eternal life is a great, amazing promise, what a great hope is found in it, but also life right now and life to the full abundantly we all want life a, a life that's worth living we want a life we want to live a life that's worth living and and there's something that is deep in the soul of every man that longs for that searches for meaning in life someone once said the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon but that we wait so long to begin it. A pastor was once talking to a man who had recently committed his life to Christ, and he said, now this means that you don't have to fear death anymore. The man responded, I have not feared death. What I have been afraid of is wasting my life. Many of you know my story, that uh, my alcoholic father turned his life around asked for help, actually came to faith in Jesus Christ, when he got to the point in his life at 75 years old, when he realized that he had wasted almost all of his life. And this is an important thing for us to understand, that God wants us to live life 
to the full. But what does it mean? We want to understand that. Many people just go through the motions of living. If you know what I mean. They just go through the motions. They had hopes and dreams. But the struggles and the defeats of life, they beat them down. And so they consign themselves to living in a rut, without purpose, without meaning. Now, they all may have the appearance or or seeming like they got everything together, but there's something missing. The spark of life is missing. They're empty. They're longing for life. They're going through the motions, you might say. To quote from the famous American philosopher, Jackson Brown, I'm going to give you a quote from a a song he wrote called The Pretender. Let me just give you some of these words because I think it's revealing of that aspect of life. He writes it this way. Well, he actually sang it. I'm going to rent myself a house in the shade of the freeway. Going to pack my lunch in the morning and go to work each day. And when the evening rolls around, I'll go on home and lay my body down. And when the morning light comes streaming in, I'll get up and do it again. Amen. I'm going to be a happy idiot and struggle for the legal tender where the ads take aim and lay their claim to the heart and soul of the spender and believe in whatever may lie in those things that money can buy, though true love could have been a contender. Are you there? Say a prayer for the pretender who started out so young and strong only to surrender. People who go through life just living the motions of life. There's an emptiness. The, there's, a, there's a lostness. This is why the words of Jesus here are so important for us. He promises to give us life and life abundantly. Life to the full. Let's look at these, last, uh, these verses and understand what it means to have life to the full, but also understand what it doesn't mean. Let's begin in verse 9. Read through this section. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And remember that he is also the only door to life, eternal life. And in fact, in another place he said very clearly, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. So he's the only door. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He'll, he'll, he'll take what you got, man. He wants to steal and kill and to destroy. But he said, I have come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Life to the full. I am the good shepherd. Here's the basis of that promise. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling, in other words, he's just a hired hand. The hireling and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, he beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And so he said, that's not so with me. I am that good shepherd. He flees because he's a hireling, and he's not concerned about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, verse 14, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Now, here's something interesting. Here he's speaking to a Jewish crowd, calling them, of course, to understand eternal life and the hope that he gives in that relationship. But then he speaks of other sheep. And here he's referring to us, the church. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock, with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Now, here's a great verse that we need to really see. No one has taken my life from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. All right, here's a great set of verses. Let's go through it and understand how it applies to our lives. The promise he's speaking of, the central theme here is that he gives life and life abundantly to the full. But I want to look at this and I want us to understand what life to the full is not. Jesus begins this message by saying the thief comes only to steal and to kill 
and destroy. Now, in Scripture, God lays out a contrast. Many, many places and times, he lays out a contrast between the choices that we have in life. Uh, for example, when Israel first entered into the Holy Land, God had uh, uh, Joshua bring the people into this valley, and there was a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other side. And he had leaders stand on one mountain, the other leaders stand on the other mountain. So the leaders on one mountain would shout out to the group, to the, the nation of Israel, the tragedies that would come on their life if they would choose the way of evil, choose the way of worldliness. Other leaders would stand on the other mountain, and they would shout out the blessings that would come by following the Lord. Follow the Lord, man, the favor of God, the pleasure of God, the blessings of God, and it's just an encouragement. And the other leaders on this side would shout out the, 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 the tragedies, the curses, the difficulties of life. And it's interesting because they would say, you know, uh, a Christian is the man who does this. And the whole group would say, amen. And then they say, and then tragedy will come in your life if you do this. And the whole crowd would say, amen. He wants them to know that there is a valley of decision. Another one. At the end of his life, Joshua gathered all of the people of Israel together again. And he brought again another challenge. And he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether it's the God of this people in, around us or the God who saved us. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I love that. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a valley of decision. There's a decision that must be made. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Hey there, it's a wide path, man, and many people go down that road and they destroy their lives. And he says, the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So therefore, find it. He's offering that. Now, in John 10, what we need to see is that the plan of the enemy is to destroy. Jesus said, the, the enemy, the thief, comes to steal and kill and to destroy. Uh, this is plainly told to us in, by Jesus here in verse 10. But the enemy doesn't want you to know that. The enemy's not going to tell you that up front because his plan is deception. The whole idea is to make death look like life. The whole idea is to deceive, to lie. I mean, wouldn't it be great if everything was just so plainly clear right before us that we could distinguish between lies and truth very easily? Wouldn't it be great if you're out shopping for a car and the weaselly used car salesman always wore a plaid jacket with a pink tie? That's him, I know right away, this guy is a schemer. And so wouldn't it be great if it was like this? But it's not, the whole idea of deception is to make death look like life. You know, there's a pamphlet put out by Campus Crusade uh, it was called The Four Spiritual Laws. The first one read this way, begins this way. God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. Now, if the, if the enemy could create a pamphlet, it would begin this way. The devil hates you and has a destructive plan for your life. Wouldn't it be great if it was that clear? No, it is not that clear. He uses lies. And in fact, this is addressed in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 where the Lord says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, anyone in, in this room who's ever lived on both sides of this fence, if you've ever lived on the other side of that fence, you can add your own testimony. You already know it's true, that there is destruction that comes with it. See, the whole point is that the deception is to make that lifestyle look fun, exhilarating. It's, it, it is the, the party, man. You don't want to be missing out because it is just the life, man. That is the thing to have. But, of course, it's hiding the fact that it destroys. One of the examples we've been looking at lately 
is the prodigal son. Remember his story. Here's a young man. He wants his inheritance early. He gets it. He's got all of this money. And so what does he do with this money? He goes out and he spends it on worldly living. Man, he's got it going on. He's got the party. He's got the women. He's got the friends, so-called. And they're just spending it up. But one of the things that we need to see is that he lost it all. All that he had. He had a lot of money all gone. The enemy stole all of it. And then the destruction that came on his life, the destruction, all of it gone, destroyed his life. And he got to the point where he was jealous of the pig's food and it dawned on him and occurred to him, my father's servants eat better than this. So he made the decision that he was going to go home to his father, to his father's house. But he wasn't going to go back to be a son. He didn't deserve to be a son. And so he said he's going to go back just to get a job. That's what he wanted. He just wanted a job. See, this is why this is so important. If you've ever wondered, what is God's response to me? If I I do the party thing and I live the world thing and and I destroy my life, is he done with me? Is he going to throw me away? What's he going to say to me? What's his heart after me? Is it, you know, when I come back to the Lord, is he going to raise his holy finger at me and say, I knew, I knew you'd come calling back someday. Well, do bad because you know what? You blew it, pal. Is that God's heart? No, this is why the story of the prodigal son is so good for us. Because he decides to go home. He needs to be with his father. So he goes home. The glorious part of the story is when the father sees him a long way off and starts running down the road toward his son. This is a picture of God's heart. He starts running down the road. He falls on his son. He starts kissing him. My son, my son. What's interesting is that the son has got the speech all prepared. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I just need a job. Can I just have a job? Make me one of your hired men. You can imagine the heart of the father here. This is the heart that we've got to see. It's the heart of God. You can always imagine him interrupting this. And he calls out, bring a robe and put it on my son. Get some sandals and put it on the feet of my son. Get a ring and put it on the finger of my son. My son was dead, but is now alive. My son was lost, but is now found. And kill the fatted calf. We are going to have a feast. We're going to have a celebration. My son has come home. I love this story because it's such an important lesson for us of the heart of God in redeeming us. He calls us. He holds out his hand all day long waiting for us to come home. And in fact, he gives another warning in Proverbs 7, verses 25 to 26. He uses the picture of a woman here as a picture of worldliness and the whole path of destruction. And he says, don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Over and over, the Lord gives that warning. Now, back to John 10. Here's another thing we need to see. And that comes from this whole uh, picture of Jesus being the shepherd and us the sheep, which is don't follow the wrong voice. Uh, Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. See, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. The voice of the Lord. When you're reading the Gospels, you know, and we're in John, and we're hearing the words of the Lord. If you're hearing the words of the Lord and, and, and there's something inside your soul that just resonates with that, you're, you hear his voice and you hear his words and you realize these are the words of life. There's something in your soul that resonates with it. See, the enemy knows that there is a longing in everyone for life. And he's going to try to appeal to that desire with things that don't satisfy the soul by giving, you might say, the siren song, a different voice. Isaiah 55, verse 2 is a picture of this. We were just studying this uh, on Wednesday through our Isaiah study. But listen to these words. God, again, is calling to Israel. And he says, why do you spend money for what is not bread? Why do you spend your wages for what does not satisfy 
Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. I love that phrase. Listen. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. It's like when I was raising my kids. Whenever you want to speak to their heart, you want to know that they are listening. And so you would often say to them, look at me, listen to me, listen to what I'm saying. There's nothing worse than trying to speak to a kid and you know that they've got you tuned out. They are tuned out, they have got a wall between you and them, and, and you, you're lecturing them and they're not hearing a word. There's eyes open, but there's nobody there. And so he's saying this similar thing, listen to me. He's asking for our heart to listen. Listen to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. If the prodigal son could be here today, you know, if, if we could have him come out. No, I'm just kidding. There's nobody there. But what, if we could have the prodigal son come out here and give his testimony, what would he say? We say, come on out here. And you, what would you tell the people today? You know what I think he would say? I think he would say, please learn a lesson from my life. Please learn a lesson from my life. It wasn't worth it. Everything that I had, the enemy stole from me. I had nothing. Let me tell you what I learned. Run to your father as fast as you can get. Don't go there and stay with your father. I love the picture of that voice. See, life to the full, he's offering it to us. But we have to know what life to the full is not. For example, life to the full is not found in the image of looking good, the image of looking perfect, of having everything together. It's an Im it is an image without substance. Let's talk about Facebook, shall we? Facebook, you know, is very, very interesting. But one of the things that make people defeated and discouraged in life is when they compare their ordinary life to everybody else's highlight reels. Isn't Facebook a highlight reel? You know what I'm saying? Are you guys with me on this? Facebook, you know, you look at other people's Facebook pages and you think, wow, look, they got everything together. I mean, their kids are always smiling, they're always doing fun stuff, and they're always, look like they're always just together and obedient, and they're just living the life, man. And look at their marriage, it looks like they're always got that twinkle in their eye, and they're always doing everything, it's great. And then look at my life. You know, look at us. We just got an ordinary life. We got troubles and things going on, and there's, there's issues in our marriage, and there's stuff with our kids. We got an ordinary life. But look at everybody else. All you got to do is Facebook and see it. They're all great and perfect. But see, they're highlight reels. Life to the full does not mean that you're free from troubles or heartaches. That's not what it means. It's quite different than that. Also, living life to the full doesn't mean that you live uh, with constant euphoria or constant up. You know, and I think sometimes people uh, have this image that you're always going to be up and you're always going to have this constant euphoria and you're going to go around, everything is just great and wonderful and it's always good and you're always up. Wouldn't it be great if everything was always up? Ecclesiastes 3 says, this is verses 1 and 4, there's an appointed time for everything. There's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. It was funny. Uh, someone once saw my wife and me shopping, and they later commented anonymously that uh, I wasn't smiling. And apparently the expectation is for Christians to always be up while shopping for oranges. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I was aghast when I saw that comment. I said, what are you expecting? I, I'm supposed to be in the store. Fuji apples are on sale, honey. <laughs> this, this is great. This is like, wow, life is so good. Let's go see what the price of bananas are. Yes. You see, th that's, that's the problem, is that life has troubles. Does living life to the full mean that you don't have issues, don't have troubles? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Then you go back to John 10, and you realize the statement of the, uh, of the Lord here. It's very key for us. He is the way. He is the life. Life is found in what? It's 
found in him. He is life. He spoke the words of life. Life comes from him. Therefore, life is found in him. He is the way. He is the life. Verse 9, Jesus said he's the door. If anyone enters through him, he shall be saved, and he will find pasture. It's a picture of the sheep eating contentedly in the pasture. He is the way. Then in verse 11, he's the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd is good. He brings that which is good. When you have a relationship to the shepherd, the shepherd brings that which is good. He's the life. That's the point. See, abundant life is found in being content. Life to the full, content. See, sheep are notoriously skittish and fearful. And uh, they are absolutely in need of a shepherd. If a, if a sheep does not have a shepherd, they will fall off a cliff. They will run over here. They will scatter. And wolves can pick them off in troubles and they destroy their lives. That's the point. But when there is that shepherd, when the sheep are in the presence of the shepherd, ah, now there's peace. They can lie down in peace. They come to trust the shepherd. Paul spoke to us, wrote to us in Philippians 4, that he found the secret of being content. Uh, to be content. He said, I have found the secret, whether he had much or whether he had little. But he revealed that it is an aspect of faith. That con being content, living life to the full, is an aspect of faith. It comes from the relationship to the shepherd. When the sheep are in the presence of the shepherd, this is Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. I have learned the secret. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. That's really key. I know how to get along with humble means. I also now know how to live in prosperity. You, that is harder than you think. Many people who, who find themselves in a place uh, you know, they've climbed the ladder and they've reached the top. Find themselves empty, lost. What now? They've lost direction. They've become lost with purpose. They don't have a purpose or meaning anymore. They're lost. He says, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to get along in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. And it's this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He's the strength of my life. I do all things through him. He gives the grace to me. He is the one who pours out my life. He's the one who directs the steps of my life. I can do all things through him. The problem for many people is that they focus on what they lack. They're constantly focusing on what they lack. If they could just be smarter, if they could just be thinner, if they could just be better looking, if they could just have more money, if they could just have a better job uh, or an easier job or someone to support them and they didn't have to work at all, then, then I would be content. The problem is you get one of those things, you still want something else. You, want so you get something else, I still want, that's not still enough. The focus is what they lack and that's what makes people very discontented. And then you could actually have it all and still be discontented. Because the key is found in, in what Paul gives to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. The Lord said to me this, it's my grace. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. Power is perfected in weakness. I'm well contented in weaknesses distresses, difficulties for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Is it possible to be contented in distresses? Is it possible to be contented in difficulties? He said, yes, because you're in the presence of the shepherd. This is the important thing for us to understand. Here's another word that's good for us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Now, he's addressing, I think he's really addressing the, the culture in which we live. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. Do you get the connection? Make sure your, your, your character is free from love of money. What then should you have a love of? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is with you, the shepherd, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the prince of life is with you. This is the whole point. David said, even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You are with me. In another place, he writes, you have been my confidence since my youth. I love that. We, if we could take hold of that, you have been my confidence since my youth. That's living. That is living right there. You've taken hold of the fact that he is the shepherd. We are the sheep. The shepherd is always with us. We are content in his presence and understand that you, O oh Lord, have been my confidence since my youth. Now, this is a great word for us because many people, they, they have this idea. I think we live in a culture that, that feeds into the idea that really what we need is self-confidence. If we could just have more self-confidence, we could really, you know, get our lives together. Can I suggest something to you? God does not want us to have self-confidence. God does not want us to have self-confidence. But then what does he want? He wants us to have God confidence. Yeah. It's a completely different thing. Self-confidence is confidence in self. I'm sorry, but how do we say this nicely? We don't have enough self to be confident in. Amen? But God confidence is a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother thing. We're talking about the God of the universe who spoke all things to be, is with you, is for you, his pleasure is upon you, his favor is upon you. It is God in your life that makes all the difference in the world. David said, you have been my confidence. That's faith in real life. That's the way God wants us to live. Enough with self-confidence. Enough of the, don't even read the books. We need God confidence. There's a book that we could read. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's what we need, God confidence. And then notice this, life is found also in God's purpose. We need purpose in our lives. Look at Jesus as our example. Does Jesus have a purpose in his life? Oh, absolutely. God sent the Son with a purpose. Speak my heart. Give the world my heart. Represent my hope, my promise. Call people out of the darkness, out of despair, out of loneliness, out of brokenness. Set free the captive. He's got a purpose of the highest order. He's sent by God. Here's the thing. Jesus said, the sheep follow me. He's, this is where he's going. He's going to, to make a difference in people's lives. He's going to call and redeem and, and bring people into a, a place of edification and life with God. He says, you're my sheep. You follow what I'm doing. You want purpose in your life? There's a purpose. You look at the relationship of Jesus. In verse 3, he spoke of the Father as the doorkeeper and he the shepherd. Another kind of a picture of that relationship. He is the one who opens for the shepherd to come and lead the sheep out. Then in verses 14 and 15, remember we read, he compares the relationship between a shepherd and sheep to his own relationship to the Father. As the Father knows me, and I know him, so I know my sheep and they know me. What well, this beautiful picture for us. The relationship is seen in the fact that Jesus is about his Father's business. He's doing what his Father sent him to do. John 5, 19, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the, these things the Son does in like manner. You want a purpose? Make a difference in someone's life. Build, edify, strengthen, redeem, call. Bring people to a, a hope, a promise, helping them understand that they can come out of the darkness and out of the pit of miry clay and into a place where they can stand on a rock and have their lives glorify the Lord. Make a difference in someone's life. You know, many people have won the lottery only to find themselves empty, without purpose, without meaning. They've lost their way. Be about your father's business. 
And you will find purpose and meaning in your life. You will live life to the full because you are living the life that God has given you to live. And then lastly, we'll close with this. The shepherd brings abundant life. It's the shepherd that brings life. The theme of the chapter, Jesus is the shepherd. Oh, if we could only apply that, it would radically change our lives. David, you remember King David, he was a shepherd. And he wrote Psalm 23, which we read before. But I want to look at a few verses because it gives us this picture of that relationship. The Lord is my shepherd, he says, therefore I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. See, if, you, if the Lord is your shepherd, all of those things are so. Trust that as the shepherd you shall not want. That he will make you lie down in green pastures. He will lead you beside still waters. He will restore your soul and he will guide you in the paths of that are right and good. Psalm 127, verse 2. It's vain for you to rise up early. I love this verse. It's vain. What's that word vain mean? It's a waste of time. It's empty. He says, it's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. Don't you know? It is he who gives to his beloved even while he's sleeping. Ah, the relationship of the shepherd. Faith. You've been my confidence since my youth. David wrote that the Lord guides the paths of righteousness. When you follow God, he will lead you in the paths that are right and good. His way is good and right. Frank Sinatra sang a song. Later, Elvis Presley also sang it. Famous song called My Way. I did it my way. I want to read you just a few of the words. I planned, Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley wrote, sang, I planned each chartered course, each careful step along the way, and more, much more than this. I did it my, don't buy the CD. I did it my way. I did it my way? Yeah, that's the pride of my life. You can hear the pride coming through it. Oh, sure, regrets, I've had a few, but I did it my way. Troubles, oh yeah, but I did it my way. I did, it my, I did it my way. One of the ways that we get into trouble is when we do things our way. What we need is for God to lead us in the steps that are right and good. He leads us in the paths that are right. Sometimes a shepherd will stand in the way of the sheep that's going the wrong way. No, you're not going there. The Lord stands in the way. No. Don't go over there. There's a cliff there. Don't go there. There's mud over there. No. No. How about this green pasture? How about we go there? And then the, the shepherd, you know, he's got a, a staff. A little crook on it for a reason. As soon as the, the sheep starts going the wrong way, no. Why? Because God is trying to keep us from destroying our lives. Lastly. Contentment is found in this. Life to the full is found in this. Thank God for what you have. Be thankful. Have a heart that thanks God. Isn't that what it's found in? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Here's a great verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, Guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, for the encouragement to know that as our good shepherd, you're with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And Lord, we are so thankful for those great truths. I pray, oh God, that we would take hold of it that we would truly take hold of those promises. God, I pray that we would also understand that the promise of life to the full is found in that relationship. God, you've been my confidence from my youth. You have been my shepherd. You're with me. You'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. 
You're the good shepherd that does good. You lead me in the paths that are right and that are good. God, I pray that we learn to trust you. Tr truly learn to trust you and not be wayward. Church, this morning, would you say it to the Lord? Be my good shepherd. I want to trust you to order the steps of my life. God, be the confidence of my youth. Be the confidence of my life. God, I will trust you now as my shepherd. Would you just raise your, uh, uh, your hand if you would just say that to the Lord? God, be my shepherd. I need you today, oh God. Father, thank you so much for everyone who responds to you and gives to you a heart to trust you and honor you. We look to you now to just bless in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Can we give the Lord praise?